Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Aperio Teaching and Learning Call on Wednesday, March 7th. And uh, my name is Neil Caden. I'm your facilitator for today. We have a pretty packed agenda, um, but we'll try not to rush it either. So we're going to try and find a good balance there. Uh, we have, um, I pasted the, oh, and somebody else pasted the Etherpad in there. Perfect. The Etherpad link. So please sign up on the Etherpad. I see people have already started doing that. I need to do that <coughs> right now. And today's agenda, we are going to have our usual sort of um, welcoming and quick project updates. And then we're going to focus on functional issues with the gradebook. Uh, and Charles Bristow from Illinois State is going to present that. And time permitting, and I think we will have some time, uh, Will Mahajas will um, discuss some issues with the Samago user interface. And then we'll have a wrap up from there. Um, so we will start off with um, any project updates. I'll give a quick one on Sakai 12. Uh, Sakai 12, uh, the RCO3 looks really, really, really close. We've gotten through, as of yesterday, we had gotten through all the blocker bugs, or this morning, we got gotten through all the blocker bugs except for one, which is specific just to Oracle. And then a new blocker, potential blocker issue is just opened, I noticed. So uh, RCO3, I thought for sure was going to be this week. Um, it's still possible we'll do it. We were just hoping to get an RCO3 with no blocker bugs. So... Um, there's a little bit of assessment we need to figure, you know, to do to figure out if we're going to be able to achieve that. And when we get to RCO3, we're going to need as much testing uh, as possible because the idea is once we get an RCO3 out, if we have no blocker bugs in it, that we will want to make end up making that our our GA or generally available release. But again, that assumes we don't find any blocker priority um, level issues. So getting really really close on 12. Hoping to push it out um, in the next week or two, but you know, as usual, it depends on um, um, it depends on things like finding additional blockers. And I do get the sense that there are resources to respond to blocker priority issues pretty quickly. So I think we're going to try and accelerate as quickly as we can. That's the best I think I can do on that update at the moment. Um, any other announcements? I have a couple quick announcements. Um, one is um, that we're launching a, a new um, workshop series, the Sakai Bellwether Brainstorming. It's a three-part series, and we're going to talk about just some different topics. Um, it's it's sort of a uh, kind of a birds of a feather-ish format, um, and it's uh, the it's going to be three. Wednesdays, um, actually the alternate Wednesdays to the teaching and learning call was how I planned it out. So um, March 14th, the topic's going to be LTI and API integrations. Um, March 28th, competencies, outcomes, and reporting. And then April, for, or April 11th, dashboards, notifications, and activity streams. Uh, so if you're interested in registering, um, I'm going to paste the URL in here into the chat um, you'll see a description there now right now as i said they're um, timed for um, you know 10 a.m eastern although i did have a request from some folks on the pacific time zone to see if we could bump it a little bit later so it's possible there may be a slight time shift in that um, but I'm, I'm just kind of checking schedules to see if there's um, another time slot that would work so um, currently they're scheduled for 10 a.m. <laughs> And, um, and the second quick announcement is just that um, we are going to talk a little bit about the Samago stuff uh, at the end of today's uh, teaching and learning call. But there's also a UX meeting that follows this meeting at 11. Um, so everyone who's interested is welcome to attend. We'll probably continue the discussion about Samago at that meeting. So uh, feel free to join us for that. And that's actually going to be in room three. That's uh, room three is the room we usually meet in. Um, so at 11, I'm going to hop over to the other room. But you're all welcome to join. Thank you, Wilma. I assume you're complete. Yes, that's all. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Anyone else have any announcements? OK, uh, since there are no announcements, no nothing in the chat that I see, um, 
and no one's speaking up, we'll assume we should move on. So Charles, would you be uh, able to introduce yourself and uh, introduce the topic and get started? Sure, I'm happy to. So I'm Charles Bristow. I work at Illinois State University for our Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. And one of the, my main um, roles here now is supporting faculty using our installation of Sakai, uh, which we call ReggieNet. And just as a little background, um, we had been using Gradebook 2, and we switched to using Gradebook NG uh, completely for everyone starting this past fall semester. And so what we've discovered various things that are <clears throat> working as they are intended, but we think they should work differently. Um, so I just wanted to bring up uh, a number of the, the issues that we've run across um, and see if we could get some consensus about whether um, you guys agree with us and then we can actually, uh, at the moment, none of these actually do have a JIRA associated with them. Um, so we will be, um, if we find a consensus here, we'll try and uh, put in a JIRA that reflects that consensus and, and go forward from there, if that makes sense. So, and feel free to jump in with questions anytime. Um, and if there's nothing at the moment, I'll go ahead and start with number one. I've got about half a dozen things that I, that I wanted to see if we could get through today. If we get through of them all, that's great. If not, well, we can talk about them elsewhere. Uh, the first one has to do with course grade overrides. So can everybody see my screen okay? Is that magnified enough that you can see that? I'm going to assume yes, since nobody says no. Um, so if we look at this first student, this student um, currently has an 89.7. They've almost got an A. So if I do a course grade override for this and give them an A, the system changes the percentage displayed to the minimum threshold value for that overridden grade. And I don't particularly like that. I would prefer to see the original percentage there. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that, that that is the way it functioned in Gradebook 2. I'll keep returning to Gradebook 2 since that what we, that's what we were used to. Um, so um, I'd like to see that stay, that, that percentage that's displayed um, just remain the actual student's percentage. You can always go in and click on this and see it, but you have to go in and look at it to find out what that original percentage is. There's nothing that, um, that I have to go looking for it, and I'd rather not have to do that. Um, the other thing is, if I went in and changed a grade in here somewhere, it, I wouldn't then know what the new percentage is without going and looking for it. So um, I don't know how other people feel about that idea. That's topic number one. So I don't know if we want to go through all the topics and then discuss them all at the end or discuss them one by one. I maybe think maybe we should take a pause here one. and see how, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking maybe we should take a pause here and see what people are, are thinking. So um, do you want to read out of the chat or do you want me, me I, to read I it can out? see it, yeah. Okay. And maybe read it, if you could read it out loud because that way we can get it on okay. the recording. So uh, let's see, Lauren number one says, good point. Lauren number two says, um, is just kind of a, rehash of, of what I just said to, to get it into the chat, I guess. Um, Jennifer notes that it did that in Gradebook Classic as well. I assume that it did it, that it was mirroring the functioning in Gradebook Classic. So it does seem like that's a change for everybody then. Yeah, and I'll remind folks that once you open uh, Jira Charles um, that there is a voting mechanism in, in mm -hmm. Jira, so I'd recommend people to do that and or put comments on. Both those things are really, really helpful. Um, voting and comments. We don't have a, uh, an exact process for a thing gets a certain amount of votes, therefore it happens, but it shows a lot of community interest and that does count for something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and comments count for a lot too. Okay, we've got another comment that's saying the traditional behavior in Gradebook Classic was for the overridden grade to change. So it, it changed the percentage in Gradebook Classic? 
He says yes. Adam suggested a slightly different kind of fix um, for showing strike through through drop grades. You could oh adopt a strike through through the original calculation and show the override. That could be an additional feature of it that would help indicate that that's an overridden grade. Um, even the bolding sometimes isn't totally obvious. Dave E says you'd have to provide information about what the strike through means. Uh, it's not a setting as far as I know, Jennifer. Um, It's just, that's just the way it, it displays. Laura Sierra agrees that we should display the actual earned grade calculation. Davey is asking whether this would affect what the student sees. I assume it would, because I think currently what the, well, let's say the student sees that 90%, I believe. Yes. So the student is seeing that 90%. Um, I assume that if it was displaying the original 89.7%, that's what the student would see as well. So they see A, 90%. In grade book two, they did see, it would say A, 89.7%. So that they would kind of know that um, they had been pushed up a letter grade. So currently, yes. Look, Laura Ed says they don't know that it's an override. Well, they could figure it out if they did their math, but um, <clears throat> yeah, grade book two did have an indicator that, that the grade was overridden. So it seems like we've got more or less agreement that, that the original grade percent should be displayed rather than the, the threshold for the letter grade. Yeah, you certainly got in a lot of positive feedback on that idea in, the, in this call. Okay, so we'll, we'll um, I'll probably actually have Ben Raplier, um, our admin guy, put the jeer in. He's better at it than I am. So, um, but we've been in, I've been talking to him about this stuff anyway. He's not able to be here today because of a sick child, um, but I'll, I'll forward everything to him once we're done. Okay, so let's see, I'm trying to catch up. Okay, it looks like there's general agreement on that in the chat. So um, I'll consider that one closed and we'll go on to number two. So this next one is kind of just a, a rare occurrence, but it can happen. It has to do with the course grade rounding. Um, so if we look at, at student five here, they currently have an 89.87. They've got a B. If I change one of their exam grades to a fraction higher, it has now rounded their percentage up to 90%, but it's still displaying a B because their actual percentage is slightly less than 90. And that's kind of confusing. And if it's 90%, it ought to be an A. In gradebook two, when it rounded like that, it would change the letter grade to match what, the, what it was rounded up to. Um, again, this is something rare, but it can happen and it could potentially be confusing to students in that they're seeing, well, I've got 90%, why do I have a B? And Davey is asking, does this have to do with the threshold to the thousandth? It probably does. 
um, or at least after the at least the hundreds anyway. Um, so it's just a, a a little bit of an oddity that I just happened to to run into with one instructor at one point. Like I said, it's probably not a common occurrence, but it is there and maybe ought to be addressed. Well, and Neil said, this sounds like a bug, not a feature request, and maybe it is a bug. Uh, Adam points out, if the instructor doesn't catch it on grade entry in the SIS, they could have a contestable final grade on their hands. Lord Geckler is agreeing this is a bug. Okay. More agreement that it's a bug. Any other comments? <coughs> Excuse me. All right, I'm not used to everybody agreeing with me. This is getting nerve wracking. Okay, show that one more time. So I'll switch this grade back. So they're at 89.87%. That's a B. I bump up their score a tiny bit. Oh. Wrong number. So you can see their exam grade is still 89.99% and they've got 90% uh, in some other cat in this other category. That's the only other thing that's being counted. So they're still slightly under 90%. <clears throat> but when it rounds up, it, it's not changing the letter grade to match that rounding up where 90% should be an A. Is that clear now, Sean? Okay, so agreement that that's a bug. Looks like. Okay, topic number three. Um, this one has to do with extra credit categories, and it's in some ways it's related to typical instructor behavior. So when um, our instructors, if they have an extra credit item, um, they will only put in scores where students have actually earned extra credit. They don't typically put in <coughs> zeros for those that haven't earned the extra credit. So what I've noticed is that if you have an extra credit item, or excuse me, an extra credit category <clears throat> with more than one item in it, um, it doesn't behave in the way an instructor might necessarily expect it to if they're only giving credit for one of those items. So for example, I'm gonna go down to this last student. This student currently has a 77.5%. I have an extra credit category that's worth 10%. <clears throat> I have two items in here. They're each worth five points. So that means they're, they're basically they're each worth 5% for the extra credit grade for uh, if, if somebody scored on both of them. However, if I give full credit for one of the items, it actually gives them the full 10% credit for the ex extra credit category and it's bumping their overall percentage up that whole 10% rather than the 5% the instructor might expect just by entering the five here. To actually make it calculate correctly, if they haven't earned anything for the second extra credit, I actually have to put the zero in and now they're just getting the 5% over their original 77% and a half percent that they have. Does that make sense? 
so Laura is actually um, asking about my weighted categories add up to 110%. They do with the extra credit. The non-extra credit categories add up to 100. Um, and you can do that if we look at it in settings um, and go to categories and weightings. Here are my categories. I've got 50% um, in exams, 50% in homework. That adds up to 100%. And then there's an extra 10% that can be extra credit. <clears throat> However, so since instructor practice generally is not to put those zeros in, this student, if that zero isn't there, is getting more extra credit. Than the, than the instructor might be expecting them to be receiving. So I don't know what the fix is for this. Um, I mean, it's calculating the way it's supposed to, but because it's kind of in, uh, it's calculating it in a, in a contrary way to what we see in, in instructor practice, um, Terry asked, could you have EC1 and EC2 in separate categories? Yes, you could, and that would fix the problem, but instructors don't necessarily think that way. Um, uh, let's see. Right, so Davey says, you're saying we'd have to award zeros for non-extra, for non, where's, I lost Dave's note. Oh, ah, it's jumping so fast, I can't keep up. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, have to, you have to award the zeros for the unearned extra credit because that's not typically what, what instructors do. Um, so, yeah. But I think having the gradebook calculate extra credit differently than it um, calculates other grade items seems like that's a recipe for complexity. Yeah, I'm not sure that there's really an easy fix to this one. Um, it's just something I wanted to, to bring up. Um, yeah, Davey says adding, having multiple EC categories increases the clunkiness. Um, and somebody asked about setting zeros. Yes, that would that works, but the, the instructor has to remember to do that. And, and again, they don't necessarily like putting in zeros for students that don't earn extra credit because that freaks students out because they, they think then the zeros are counting against them in some way. <clears throat> so instructors are reluctant um, to do that. Wilma says you could add them as EC items instead of categories. True, but sometimes they don't necessarily fit into an existing category. It's, um, that like I, I don't know that there really is an easy answer to this one, but I thought it was worth a discussion. I'm going to move on to your next, uh, next item. <laughs> Adam says he thought he proposed the easy answer. <laughs> I can't remember what Adam proposed. I think he was proposing um, treating extra credit items uh, differently yeah. in terms of the grade <laughs> calculation. There, he wrote it. Yeah. So count all items as zero unless otherwise specified just for extra credit categories. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, that and I think, you know, Neil's right, that would add some complexity to the, the programming for, for Gradebook. It's, it, I, I didn't necessarily think there, there was a real easy fix for this. Um, it's just, it's, it's there, and, and I've run across it a couple times with instructors, so. Okay. All right, next item is the way the assignment tool interacts with, um, gradebook. Um, so I have two uh, assignments here in my homework sec in my homework um, thing and they're they're associated with an assignment in two different ways. This first one um, when I was in the assignment tool I had the assignment tool create the item in the gradebook 
And when it does so, it puts the nice little icon up. And the item is actually locked the same way it is uh, for things coming from tests and quizzes. This second item over is one where I had already created the gradebook item. And oops, I went too far there. Actually, maybe what I'll do is I'll turn off the exams here for the moment and move back over. Um, this one, when I created, I created this gradebook item first in the grade in the assignment tool. I associated with an already existing item, and in this case, the gradebook item is not locked, and I can edit grades here, same way as I would for any other gradebook item. So there's inconsistency in the way the assignment tool is <coughs> um, interacting with the gradebook. Um, and this can also be confusing to um, instructors because they can see that they can change one grade here, but not another one. Um, this particularly comes up if, if they've imported um, items from, uh, if they've imported stuff from a previous course, then all the items are already in the gradebook. But then if they add a new assignment and add it to the gradebook automatically from the assignment tool, then it's behaving like this one is. It's locked and it's not the same as the others. So um, Laura Sierra is asking, this is the way Gradebook 2 worked, though. I didn't think it did. I thought that any, um, oh, she's saying, yes, it does. Um, I thought that Gradebook 2, um, if uh, it was associated with an assignment, then it was, it was locked from Gradebook 2 as well. Well, yeah, and for Gradebook 2, you could um, add or associate, but the behavior with, within the Gradebook was the same. Even if it was just associated, the item was still locked within Gradebook 2. No, Laura's, Laura's are disagreeing me. Okay, I thought it did, but... Wilma is saying, ideally, I think all items should be editable from the gradebook, but that's a different dis discussion. So maybe that's a better overall um, fix for this issue. Again, I'm not sure that there's an easy fix. Um, for this, just again, something we've noticed. John says, we have always said items coming from the assignment tool must be graded in GB2. That's, oh, must be graded in the tool. Okay, he just corrected himself. Yeah, that's that makes more sense. Um, we generally tell people that too, but um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be graded. They can't be changed within the gradebook itself. <clears throat> All right, Laura's pointing out that in Gradebook 2, you had to check the source field in Gradebook 2 to know where the item origin originated. And here, actually, in this Gradebook, you can't even see that. Um, it's not... Um, actually, I'm trying to think. No, I guess it didn't... If it was associated, it didn't show the source field. The sources being the assignment tool did it. So it's, I guess, the... It's a little bit, it's just, it's just the inconsistency that, that bugs me. There's no indication that this thing is coming from, these grades are potentially coming from the assignment tool, um, and it doesn't behave the same way as the one where it's added. So I think in the latest version in Sakai 12, it does indicate that the grade is coming from 
a different, you know, coming from the tool. Even if it's just associated as opposed to added? Oh, I guess I missed that distinction, associated versus Right, added. so 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 this one where, where, where the indicator is present and the grades are locked, that one was added by the gradebook tool. This one is just associated and it doesn't have that indicator. <clears throat> yeah, Dave E says, I'm going to go check nightly. I was going to check a couple things on nightly this morning myself, but I didn't get a chance to do it because um, I had somebody come in with questions <clears throat> about gradebook as it happened. So how do you create an associated? I'm sorry, I missed that. Is that you said by importing from a previous from another site, and that's how it becomes associated, rather than right. okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, because then you then I think you'd have to go into the assignments tool, update the assignment, and make sure it's associated with the correct item. Or sometimes people just create things in the gradebook first and then associate after. I mean that that workflow happens as well, but then some people will create the assignment and add it directly from the assignment tool so different workflows end up with different behavior so throw that out there <clears throat> not again not sure exactly what the solution is <clears throat> it may be that just permitting everything to be graded but it would still be nice to have a an indicator that this was associated with the assignment. Okay, <clears throat> a couple more things that I had um, basically relate to student display of um, of the grade book. Um, so if I go to this student, um, one thing is if there is no grade present, I can't see what the maximum points available for that item are. Um, it's just a display thing. Um, so if if the grade is is entered, I can see I've got four out of five, but I have no idea how many points are going to be available in these exams until the grade is actually present. Um, it would just be nice to see that <clears throat> that point value displayed if possible. Any comments on that one? Dave says that would help to advise students better. <laughs> Laura says, I can hear some instructors saying they don't want students to know until the day of the exam. I don't know why. Well, in that case, they could just not release that grade item. Um, it seems to me if you're, if you're showing them all the, uh, a lot of instructors will put all the grade items in at the beginning of the semester. Um, and, you know, that should be part of the syllabus, you know, how much each item is worth, um, I would think. Um, It, it doesn't make any sense to me that you would not show what, what an item is worth if, if you're letting them know that they have to do that item. Um, I think that's, you know, that should be part of the, the syllabus anyway. Um, So a question from Karen, do you think students might misread it and think they had earned that many points? Um, so student review mode. Um, okay. Returning to the previous topic, topic, Dave E said just checked on nightly. Um, association versus assigned auto entry. There is no indication in gradebook um, about it being associated with the assignments tool. Um, 
So someone is agreeing with Karen's thought about whether it, students could misread it. Um, good question. Um, unless it was somehow put into another column, if there were separate columns for grade assigned and, and how many points it was worth, that should make it then clear. Or it could be put, uh, Terry suggests, it could be put in as um, in the title column how many points it's worth, maybe in parentheses after the, the label. So we would see something that said exam one, parentheses, 100, close parentheses. Thank you, Wilma. Adam says he had a request from faculty to allow the release of overall grade statistics to students. <clears throat> Wonder if you could choose to allow assignment value or percentage of overall grade along with check boxes for stats like the display to students boxes in Gradebook 2. I'm sure that would be possible, but I, I'd like to see this whether you're allowing, you're releasing statistics or not. Um, I think it's useful information for the students to see. <clears throat> Wilma says she'd prefer points with the title since it's less likely to be confused with points earned. Actually, I agree with that. I hadn't even thought of that um, possibility myself. And that's why we have these calls, so we can brainstorm like this. Adam is agreeing with Wilma and Terry. I'm making a note of that. OK, that seems like we've got some consensus on that idea of putting it in parentheses after the, after the item label. OK, the final one is also related to student view. Um, and I'm going to pick a different student. And this is related to how comments are displayed. So if you have an assignment, um, where you have put in comments, those comments get uh, transferred over to the gradebook. And if you've put in a lot of comments, like I have for this particular assignment, a student has to scroll down past a whole lot of junk kind of to see the, the items further down the grade page. Um, it also doesn't transfer any formatting, so I actually put some bold and it's, there's actually supposed to be three paragraphs worth of information here. It's not showing paragraph breaks. It's kind of messy. Um, I'm not sure if um, what we can do about that, um, whether it's something where the comments could be expanded if the student wanted to see them, or I don't know. Um, or whether the instructor could choose whether to send the comments along with the grade. Um, same thing can happen with tests and quizzes as well. And actually, I guess forums, um, where if there's a long comment, it can really blow up the grade book if you had long comments and a bunch of different things. Um, in gradebook two, it would just indicate that, that there was a comment available with a little a balloon icon, and then you could click on that to, to see the, the, the comments actually kind of in, an, in another portion of the frame. Um, so.
So question note from Terry that that putting the 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 bubble putting a bubble icon could be an accessibility issue. Um, Laura says she likes seeing the comments without having to click. Um, and, and being able to see the comments without having to click is, is nice, but it, it can get unwieldy if you've got a lot of long, if you've got a, a bunch of assignments with long column comments here. Um, Adam, there, there's some more discussion about accessibility. Adam suggests maybe a checkbox to show all comments. Uh, Laura G, put a limit on what displays and a more button for long ones. I'd like that. Um, I think that would be a, a, a perfectly good solution, if that could be. And then particularly with a button, maybe adding on a button at the top to show all comments, toggle them completely on and off, or to expand all. <clears throat> How did you do that? Really cool. Um, and not being a programmer, I'm not sure what the most efficient solution for this is, just. Wilma says maybe ellipses with more, quote, more, dot, 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 unquote, for long ones where more is a link to a modal. Uh, Karen says, I really want the comment to be in front of student faces so they see it. She likes the, the truncated with, um, um, truncating with a more link seems like a good compromise. Um, Becky suggests being able to format comments would be very helpful. Um, Laura G, I think user experience should trump development difficulty every time. Um, <laughs> Davey says, I think these types of conversations are ones that make devs heads spin. <clears throat> Laura, Sarah, this would be a good question for the UX call coming up at 11. Why do I get the feeling I'm going to be drafted to be part of that UX call now? Davey points out 15 minutes to go. So I'm perfectly happy to wrap up here. Um, because that was my last item. Perfect. Thank you all for your input. Appreciate it. And I think we've kind of reached some consensus about some of these things. So my next step will be to kind of compile this all. I will send it over to my friend Ben, and he will um, add juras as um, necessary. Um, might hold off on the, let's see, the comments one. Um, to wait for the, the output of um, the UX um, discussion to see if anything, any kind of consensus comes out of there on, on how to, to proceed. OK, thank you, Charles. Um, so we have a, about a little less than 15 minutes left. Wilma, do you think you have enough time? Do you think 10 minutes or so would be? Yeah, I mean, we can at least start the discussion. And then if anybody is um, interested in continuing, they can hop over to the UX call at 11. So let me just um, paste this into the chat. This is a link to the JIRA that has some of the, um, the redesign images on there. So you guys can open that up while I'm trying to get my screen to share it's always a process here um so let me just kind of frame this a little bit um to let you know sort of where this is all coming from um oops hang on. 
doing too many things at once and I almost told it to update Java. Don't want to do that. All right. Um, so Longsight was um, hired to do some custom development for HEC to um, address some issues that they had with um, sections where, where they have like a, a master section that has subsections within it and instructors are assigned to different um, subsections of a course. Um, so they were needing a way to, to better display um, things that are filtered by, am I, which screen am I sharing? Are you guys seeing anything yet? Nope. Okay, no, oh, now it's just the big up. blue button one. Okay. All right, so let me drag this over here. Okay. Um, so this is the, the Samago stuff. So um, so that's kind of where this came from, because Samago was one of the tools that was an issue. Instructors needed to be a, a have to have a way to filter for just their own sections in a larger course so that they wouldn't be seeing assessments for other sections and inadvertently um, modifying the wrong one. Um, and so part of the work involved with that was sort of cleaning up the interface a little bit because this is sort of uh, the first part of it. Um, there's a second part to add a, a filter uh, where you can filter by section or group. Um, but this currently is just sort of cleaning up the overall interface. And so some of the changes that have been made here, um, again, they were done in cooperation with HEC for their instance, but we'd like to contribute them back to the community because we think that they improve the overall um, user experience for, for Samago. So um, as you can see, um, this is kind of the first screenshot of the main screen. and um, the uh, the main screen looks a lot more like the assignments landing page as opposed to what we currently have in Samago. Um, so it's been made a little more consistent. Now these changes um, are minimal changes to the back end. That was um, you know as you know Samago is kind of a bear for programming. <laughs> so uh, we tried to make as many of these UI uh, changes without affecting too much of the inner workings of Samago. It's it's more in the the overall layout um, that's changed, not as many um, behind the scenes changes. So um, we've con condensed down the view to a single list um, and then the unpublished items are labeled as draft um, and you can also um, filter by the type. So before you have like working copies, published copies. Um, there, there's now a filter built in at the top where you can filter to just view the drafts, just view the published, just view by other statuses. Um, and there was a lot of discussion on how the working versus published should be displayed. I know that was part of the email thread. So I'll just kind of um, summarize the changes so far and then we can kind of go back to that. I don't want to get too sidetracked. Um, pagination was another one. You can set the pagination on it so you're only um, seeing a few at a time. Um, you can still sort by columns. Um, there's uh, the ability to search. There's a search box up at the top so if you're looking for a particular assessment you can start typing the name and it will give you anything matching. Um, you can choose how many items you want to see on a page. Um, there's also the ability to remove multiple assessments, just like you can do with assignments. There's a checkbox on the right hand side where you can select more than one thing to um, remove it at the same time. And then the, um, the screen that shows at the top of the current Samago when you, when you land on the page, that's been moved to an ad screen, but from there the workflow is the same. Um, and it is responsive. It was made to be um, you know, mobile accessible. And then this is the student view. So that's kind of what currently exists. All of this is actually running in a, in a test environment right now that um, EDF has been working on. They've been uh, contracting with us to do some of the work on this. So, um, so we'd like to solicit feedback from the community on these changes. Do you like them? Um, I know there's probably additional changes that would need to be made. Um, this is not proposed for 12. This is something that would go into community um, version for whatever comes after 12, like 13 or whatever we call it. So um, with that, let me 
go ahead and, and open the floor for any kinds of comments, reactions. I'm seeing all good. kinds of stuff in the chat, so I apologize if I've missed most of what's been going on in the chat here. And, and Neil, when you unmuted me, did you somehow disable my chat ability as well? Because I can't seem to type in there. No, no. I mean, I just I just clicked on the little mute button next to your microphone and it shouldn't have anything to do with the chat. So that's very odd. Um, sorry about that, but no, I'm pretty sure it's not related. Let me take, take a look, but... Must be okay, some we'll problem just on kinda, my end. I'm looking at the chat. I see um, Mark uh, likes the streamlined ad feature. Um, he also asks, are working copies still treated as separate entities from published copies? Yes, in the current state of this, they are still separate. Now, I personally think that that's an issue for end users. I think it should just be one thing that people have to deal with updating. Um, that would require some additional changes that have not been made. This is what I see as kind of a first step um, and making that change would be outside the scope most likely of the current project. But but I agree that that would be an improvement and I would be interested to hear what others think about that. And feel free to chime in with audio if you have it. I know a lot of folks are typing in. It's a little hard to follow the chat, but I'll try to keep up. And we have just um, about two minutes, so maybe just a few comments and then, then wrap up. Yeah, maybe yep. go another two or three minutes. Yeah. Just to speak for the idea, this Terry Golightly, just to speak for the idea of keeping published and working copies separate, sometimes you want to keep that, um, you want to change the one that you're offering right now, but keep that legacy for further iterations of the course, keep that in the working copies because there might be a particular incident that you're dealing with in this it, in in this part of the course, but you know there is an advantage to having them separated, that probably needs to be part of the conversation, rather than automatically updating everything all the time. Yeah, I mean that's definitely part of, and that would be a, a change. Um, but I think that there's also um, the option to duplicate something before making changes, and when you would duplicate, you it would go to the draft state. So. I don't know, that's a bigger question and we certainly can't nail it down in five minutes. But um, any other reactions? Thank you, Terry, I appreciate that. People seem overall um, pleased with the 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 redesign, it's a lot more like assignments, so it's getting us closer to that consistency across tools. I guess my question would be, how would import from site handle um, this? Would it just import everything, no matter what its state? No, currently source? It, it works exactly the same as it does now, only the draft copies are are copied, which is what happens now. Only the working copies get carried over when you import a course. So um, in the current state of Samago, that's how it works right now. Right. Now, if we made a change to the way that oh, I see. Okay. Uh, items I are carefully. treated, um, then potentially there would need to be changes to the site import process as well. I, I kind of wasn't totally looking at this right. I didn't realize that And when you make something or when you publish it, I guess it became, there's a, sec, a second entry for it. I didn't realize that at first. That's yeah, why I'd ask. yeah, that's what I think is a little problematic <laughs> because um, you know people expect a draft to be kind of the first version of something. And then when you publish it, the draft becomes the published thing. Um, a lot of folks don't expect when you publish a draft that it makes a brand new entity that's published and leaves the draft sitting there. So what I've found is that, that sometimes faculty will get confused and they'll say, oh, I don't need all these drafts. Let me get rid of those. And then they go to copy their course the next semester and nothing comes over <laughs> because it only brings over the drafts. Yep. So See, been there, done that. Yeah.
All right, we see a couple more questions coming in. Maybe uh, if you, I don't, you know, answer those, and I think we need to wrap up because we're almost yeah. at eleven. Plus, you have your meeting at eleven. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, okay, so we can continue the conversation again um, on the the following uh, call. But let me see if there's anything else in the chat. Um, Beth notes that she's not seeing a link to scores. Um, that's because none of these have been taken, but there will be a link. Um, in the submitted column, just like there is now in the submitted column. And there will likely be either a score or a grade link added under the, um, the item title so that you can get to the scores that way. OK, well, thank you, Wilma. Do you feel like you're complete? Yep, I now? think I so. So I invite all of you that have an interest to join us on the UX call where we're going to continue this um, discussion. Okay, hey, great, thanks. And thank you, Charles, very much for your, all the issues you brought up um, for San Miguel and facilitating that discussion. So we just have like a minute left, which uh, to wrap up and um, just curious if anyone, and one was reminding everyone that room three is where the the uh, UX discussion is gonna happen after this. So you'd have to get out of this room and then re-log on to, um, to Big Blue Button in room three. Um, are there any suggestions? We usually like to have a minute uh, or two to talk about any suggestions for future topics. Um, we don't really have a lot of time, but if something's on top of somebody's head, we can certainly entertain that suggestion and um, and then wrap up and the day. So I'm just looking in the chat. I don't see any suggestions immediately about uh, future topic suggestions. If you come up with future topic suggestions, feel free to send it to your facilitators. Um, so there's uh, myself and uh, Trisha Gordon and Matt Burgess who are not here today, but feel free to send us your suggestions for future topics, things you'd like to get feedback on. It would be awesome. So um, any other final thoughts? Just to, uh, anyone here, any additional final things? The 22 people on the call? Let's see, oh, working uh, accessibility in the context of lessons, tool content build, topic suggestion. Okay, great. Can somebody please capture that in the in the notes in the Etherpad? I think that's a great suggestion. I, I'm sure it would be great to get a little cross-pollination with all the work the accessibility group is, is doing and bring a little bit of that back here or maybe get input from you all on issues you're finding. That sounds awesome. Uh, do we have a topic for our next meeting on the 21st? Um, let me take a quick look. I think we do. Um, just take me a second here to look. 21st. Uh, yes, we have uh, Jira Palooza scheduled for the 21st. Um, so that's reviewing teaching and learning items uh, that are tagged in Jira. Yeah, always a popular one, Jira Palooza. Just the name itself actually is what makes it exciting. I don't know about the actual content, but the name is great. So it's 11 a.m. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Feel free to keep those suggestions coming and look forward to talking to you next time. Take care. Neil, quick question yeah. before yeah. you jump off. Is there a way to capture the all the entire contents of the chat? I can't find it. Um, sure. And, so and I was messing with that. I think that might be what caused me to no longer be able to chat at all. Oh, let me let me stop the recording and oh, then I'll oh. explain how you can do that. Yeah.